So Luther was struggling to understand this. What is this righteousness of God here in verse 17? He said that because he was taught this by his uh, medieval upbringing, that he struggled with this passage mightily. It caused him to murmur and even to become angry with God. He says that he even hated God. He hated the righteousness of God. He said, if it wasn't enough that miserable sinners are already crushed by the law, now they are also threatened by the gospel. Right? Because the text says, in, he said, the text says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. We know that the righteousness of God is revealed in the law. Now, it's also revealed in the gospel. But then Luther had a breakthrough. He says, At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words. Namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. And then notice the rest of the verse. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness of God, not the active righteousness of God, but the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith. We would say imputed righteousness. So the active righteousness is God's justice by which he judges the wicked and rewards the righteous. Passive righteousness is the imputed righteousness by which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. One thing that helped Luther to understand this was by reading Augustine. This is actually a very important thing to understand about Luther, is that we tend to think of Luther as being this radical Protestant who just discarded everything and started new, but actually a lot of Luther's theology and thinking came about simply by going back to Augustine, which the medieval church claimed to respect and revere. Augustine was the greatest theologian of the Middle Ages, of the early Middle Ages, greatest theologian of the church. And so by reading Augustine, Luther had his breakthrough because Augustine himself said that, and I'm quoting here from Augustine, that the righteousness of God is not the righteousness whereby God himself is righteous, but that with which he clothes man when he justifies the ungodly. This, uh, um, not this but that, not the righteousness with which God himself is righteous, but rather the righteousness with which he clothes us when he justifies us. This is a refrain that's actually found all throughout Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings. So Augustine had a, a lot of different writings, but one group of writings are the ones he wrote against Pelagius. Because Pelagius taught that we're justified by works. Pelagius taught that you can be perfect, and so you should try to be perfect. And that you're not born with original sin. And so, in responding to Pelagius, Augustine, and we're talking back in the beginnings of the 5th century, right? So this is pretty early. Augustine himself, looking at the text, looking at Paul's teaching in Romans and Galatians, understood correctly that the righteousness of God is not this active righteousness, but rather this other righteousness, the one that he gives us. And so Luther, by reading Augustine and wrestling with the text, and also looking at the context, right? Because when he saw the second half of the verse there, as it is written, he who is righteous by faith shall live, then he understood that this is a different righteousness. Luther adds this, he says, it is called the righteousness of God because God gives it and counts it as righteousness for the sake of Christ, our mediator. And it's pretty obvious, too. If you just look at the text and you see all the places where Paul uses this phrase, the righteousness of God, well, I shouldn't say all. When you look at most of the texts, because there are a few where it's different, but if you look at most of the texts where Paul uses this phrase, it's always connected with faith, right? He'll say things like, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And then he'll say, and what proves this, that it's from faith and for faith, is the fact that the Old Testament itself said in Habakkuk 2.4 that he who is righteous by faith shall live. And so this reference to faith that is found all throughout, Paul continually says that justification is by faith. But not only justification, using the verb, but also the noun. Righteousness is by faith. He even uses the phrase the righteousness of faith, which is found about five times in his writings. And there's also this idea of the gift. Luther mentioned that, right, in the quote, where he said it's a gift. 
Uh, Paul uses that terminology. For example, in Romans 3 and verse 24, he says that um, we are justified by His grace as a gift. We're justified freely as a gift. And again, in chapter 5, verse 17, he speaks of the gift of righteousness. So it's very clear that if you just look at the context, you don't just get hung up on this one phrase, the righteousness of God. And you look at the, the use of these words uh, re relating to faith and to gift, it's very clear that it's the passive righteousness of God. And it wasn't just Luther. We should also point out that Calvin and the Reformed also agreed with that. Calvin taught that justification consists in two components. There is the forgiveness of sins, but that's not all. God doesn't just wipe the slate clean and put us back to zero. He gives us something positive, the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. That's in the Institutes, Book 3, Chapter 11, Section 2. In his commentary on Romans, Calvin said this. He said that the righteousness of God, in Romans 1.17, is the righteousness of which God is the author and which is approved at his tribunal. So he kind of had a, a double aspect to it there. He didn't just focus on the fact that God's the author of it. He also wanted to say that it's also accepted uh, and approved by God at his tribunal. So that's sort of the traditional old perspective. I mentioned, you know, Luther and Calvin, but it even goes back to Augustine in a way. 